Well, guys, we are, we made it. We made it outside. Uh, week, or week two now, being outside. This week is much hotter than last week. Last week, I was thinking to myself, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And then I looked and I saw that Sunday was going to be 104. Is that what it is today? 105. Okay. Not yet. Not, not yet. Okay, that's good. But it is warm. I'm glad you guys are braving the heat for us. Whenever I think of uh, us having to meet in interesting circumstances, whether it be right here and pop-ups in the rain or here in the heat, I'm always reminded of what our friends in Murphy do and how they meet in a barn, indoor, outdoor, all year round. And so if Murphy can do it, dang it, Rogue River can do it. Amen? All right. Well, I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Austin. I'm one of the lead Bible teachers here. And if you are joining us for uh, the first time, I want to welcome you. Whoa, look at that. I almost lost everything. That's okay. I'll just tighten it up a little bit. Uh, next week, I do have some announcements, some housekeeping things. Uh, next week, we are not going to be here. We are not going to be having a service right here uh, in this space. Instead, in your bulletins, you can see that there is an all-campus amphitheater service gathering. So this is a pretty exciting thing for us. Uh, River Valley is a church that has one church. We're one church that meets in multiple locations. We have our downtown campus. We have our Redwood campus, our Murphy campus, our Sunny Valley campus, which uh, Rachel and Tim are going to be a part of, and then, of course, our Rogue River campus. So five churches that make up one big church. And for the first time in our church's history, we're going to have one gathering of everyone. And so next week, uh, July 3rd at 10 a.m., we're all going to be at the Redwood Amphitheater. And they have shade, they have trees, and so you don't need to bring pop-ups there. Uh, they have a much better setup than we do, something that I'm not jealous of even slightly. <laughs> but uh, after that, there's also going to be barbecue. There's going to be a barbecue and baptisms following service, and so you can hang out uh, for that if you so choose. And so next week, July 3rd, at our Redwood Amphitheater, uh, make it a priority to be there. It's going to be a very good and enjoyable time. Um, uh, and one more announcement after service today, we're going to have some hot dogs on the, on the barbecue. So if you want, hang out for a bit, let's eat some hot dogs. We can hang out. You can get right in front of that awesome cooler. Um, and it will just cool you down uh, immediately, which will be super good. And so with that being said, let's, uh, let's, let's get into it today. Uh, we are continuing our series, uh, that is titled cross culture. Cross Culture is a series where we as a church have been confronting many biblical or confronting many world issues from a biblical perspective. And we've covered quite a few uncomfortable and hard topics so far in this series. If you're just joining us and you want to get caught up, you can go on our Facebook accounts or on our YouTube and you can follow along all of the lessons that we've taught through. But today uh, we're going to jump into another very important topic. But before we do that, could we all please bow our heads? Let's pray, and then we'll go ahead and get on into it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time today. We thank you for our church. We thank you that uh, these people are out here braving the elements and uh, gathering as a church, Lord, uh, to hear your word, to sing your songs, to be blessed by uh, the songs of the youth. God, I pray that uh, the rest of this morning goes wonderfully. I pray you bless our uh, potluck, and uh, we just have a great rest of this wonderful Sunday. We love you, Father, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. So on June 14th, 1999, Time Magazine published an article that was titled, The 100 Worst Ideas of the Century. And this article was sort of a review of the last 100 years. And it was trying to identify areas where society went wrong, ideas where society maybe was a little bit sideways, or ideas that were kind of bad. Some of the things that made the list were topics like the prohibition, asbestos, a new recipe for Coca-Cola. I didn't even know that. I didn't even know that Coca-Cola now has a different recipe than it was earlier. It makes sense, though, because whenever we go down to Mexico, the Mexico Coke down there is much better than, than the Coke that we have here. I'm talking about Coca-Cola, not the white powder, by the way. Um, it is much tastier, and as it turns out, that the Mexican Coke is actually the original recipe. Uh, which it does taste much better. Another thing that made the list was Woody Allen, which is kind of funny. Can you imagine being a person that makes the list of worst ideas of the 20th century? Another one is hydrogen blimps. That's fair. Another one was staffing the White House with interns during the government shutdown of 1995. I don't know whose idea that was, but that seems a little bit airheaded. Another one was the Ugandan space program, which kind of hurts my feelings a little bit. I didn't know Uganda thought about going to space, but it's a bummer that it made the list of 100 bad ideas. Another one was Rocky V. 
I've never seen the Rocky movies ever, and I feel like I should, but it appears that they should have stopped at four or maybe even one. But then my personal favorite that made the list was the children's show Barney, which I couldn't agree with more. I don't think any young kids need to see a creepy little purple dinosaur running around trying to teach lessons to, to kiddos. However, what the article determined that the worst idea of the 20th century was telemarketers. Amen? I tell you, I don't know if it's just me, but it seems like there has been an uptick in the amount of telemarketers that have been hitting my cell phone recently. It is driving me up a wall. Now, this list is kind of funny. It's something that we can giggle at. It's something that we can kind of chuckle about. But I think if we were to be serious about this question of what the worst ideas are of the 20th century, we would probably say that the worst ideas had to do with things like racism, right? And the idea of, even in our country, of, of people of color being hung in front of the city streets and in front of entire communities. I remember when I uh, was working at the Grants Pass uh, Parks Department, I was uh, talking with one of my bosses there, and he told me that there are some pretty devastating pictures about how early on in Grants Pass's history, there was some, some serious racist activity that was going on, even from the Caveman Bridge. That's not a very good idea. That's very wicked. That's very disgusting. I think if we were to talk about the worst ideas, we would probably say things like Nazism, which led to camps like Auschwitz, which obviously ended in the murders of millions and millions of people. Maybe we would say things like the gulags of Siberia or the violent drug cartels of South America. I think if we're being honest, all of these things are much worse than Barney, Woody Allen, and hydrogen blimps. So for our discussion today, here's what I want to do. I want to talk about something that bonds all of these ideas together. Something that bonds ideas like sexism, racism, and classism together. And I think the best term that can bond all of these things together is one word, and that word is tribalism. Tribalism. It's actually the title of our lesson today, tribalism. Now, some of us are not familiar with what this word is, but no doubt we are familiar with what this word describes. And so let's start with this. Let's start with the definition. What is tribalism? Well, here's how Thaddeus Williams, in his book Confronting Injustice Without Compromising Truth, describes tribalism. Here's what he says. He says, tribalism is the idea that we should divide people into group identities and then assign undesirable or evil traits to that group in such a way that we don't see the unique image bearers of God before us. And so if that is confusing to you at all, I want to give you some examples. I want to give you some handles that will make this point incredibly clear for all of us. Tribalism may look like this. We are white people. We are good. They are black people. They are bad. We are Democrats, we are caring. They are Republicans, they are heartless. We are the Islamic State, we are good. They are infidels, they are bad. We are pro-COVID vaccine, we are thoughtful. They are anti-COVID vaccine, they are careless. We are Seahawk fans, our team is the best. 49ers fans are just lame. And, for, and, not, and not only 49ers fans, Raiders fans are losers. I'm looking at my brother-in-law, Jesse, who's slowly converting my sister, which ticks me off. So you get the point. We could do this all day. Tribalism is the idea of an individual accepting a group identity and then viewing the world through whatever that group identity says. And as we all know, we could go through lists and lists and lists and lists about all of this, but every single one of us sees the effect of this in our everyday life. All we have to do is go on Facebook or parole through social media, and we will see this idea of tribalism embedded into our society and into our culture. Now, as we all know, again, our society is made up of groups of people. In fact, I even look at our church here. I look at our extended church, River Valley, and I see that we are a group. And the term that we normally use to describe our tribe or our group of people is a community, right? We talk about how we are a church family or a community of believers. We're a family of God. And whether we like it or not, every single one of us, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you come from, every single one of you is a part of a particular kind of tribe. You're a part of a particular kind of group. It doesn't matter if you're anti-establishment. Well, newsflash, you're a part of the anti-establishment tribe. We're all a part of some kind 
of tribe in our lives. And so for our time today, what I want to do is I want to spend a little bit of time peeling back a few layers of what tribalism is, and I want us to look at what healthy groups and unhealthy groups look like. And to do that, in your notes, you'll see, I have three questions that we're going to be answering today. Three questions. The first question is this. Number one, what role does having a tribe play in our lives? Number two, why do we see such a vast difference between tribes? And then number three, what makes the Christian community so unique? Sound good? Thumbs up? I want to make sure we're all dialed here. Anybody early onset heat stroke? We're good? Okay, I'll, 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 I'll get moving then so we can, uh, we can eat some hot dogs. Let's go. Number one, what role does having a tribe play in our lives? Or I guess another idea is what role does having community play in our lives? Or why is it so important? Well, this is our first letter of the day today. Our first point is this. Um, being a part of a community is letter A. It leads to a longer and healthier life. So if you're taking notes, write that down. Being a part of a community leads to a longer and healthier life. In 2004, a researcher named Dan Butner published a paper in a scientific journal. And he identified certain parts of the world where people seem to have extraordinarily long lives. He identified five cities in particular where the people in this community lived much longer and had an overall happier view on life. The five cities are this. The first city was Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, Italy, Nicoya, Costa Rica, Ikaria, Greece, and Loma Linda, California. Yeah, that surprised me as well. I thought, how could somebody like California? Um, I'm kidding. Many of you are transplants from California. I'm happy you're here. I really am. <laughs> Thank you. But Butner, here's what Dan Butner called. He called these five cities blue zones. And the term blue zone has been used to describe a quality of life in a particular area that is better than other parts of the world. And Butner and his team set out to find what these five cities have in common. And in his research, he identified nine character traits that these five cities had in common. And so I want to share these nine things with you. They're very fascinating. I think you're going to like them, especially for you geeks out there, which I know there's a lot of them. The first thing is this. These cities all have this in common. Number one, people move naturally. People move naturally. And so they garden. They go on walks. They ride their bikes. They go on strolls with their husband or with their wife in the evening. They live a lifestyle that generally involves movement. Number two, the people have a sense of purpose. The Okinawans have a word for this. It's the word ikaiji. And it's this idea of, why am I waking up in the morning? What is my purpose today? It's the idea of having something greater than yourself to look forward to in the future. Number three is this idea of downshift. So this is the concept of rest. It's the idea of stepping outside of a stressful environment and being able to take a few deep breaths and rest. Number four is what they call the 80% rule. Now, this is an interesting one. This is the idea of not overeating. And so these communities routinely would stop eating food, get this, when they're about 80% full. That's like anti-American. So you're telling me they would go to an all-you-can-eat buffet and not max their stomachs out at 110%? Yes, 80%. They would eat to the point of where it's like, maybe I could have a little bit more, but I think I'm going to call it. Of course, this discipline helps them when it comes to managing their health and, of course, when it comes to weight gain. Here's another one. Number five, a plant slant. Each of these communities eats massive amounts of beans and legumes. That's kind of interesting. I want Maddie to, Maddie, you hear that? So when I eat big cans of beans, just let me do it, all right? I love beans. Lots of beans, lots of legumes, and also they eat many plants that are grown from the earth. Green stuff I want to steer clear of, though. Amen? Okay, good. You guys are holding me accountable. Here's another one. Number six, wine at five. That's an interesting one. So each of these communities has some kind of social gathering where food is involved. In Sardinia, Italy, it's a, tra it's a tradition for people to stop what they are doing and drink wine with a friend at five o'clock. So five o'clock rolls around, the work day's over, and you would sit down, and I'd sit down with my pal Les, and we'd drink two glasses of wine just to end the day. Here's number seven, belong. Now, this one's fascinating. At the time of their research, there were 263 people that they interviewed that were over the age of 100. They were centurions. And get this, listen to this, this is crazy. All but five of these 263 people belonged to a faith-based community. 
But here's the thing. They didn't just say that they went to church. They were active participants in church. They were serving. In fact, listen to this. The most recent data suggests that attending a faith-based service four times a month will add four to 14 years to your life expectancy. Friends, do you want to live a little bit longer? I have the solution. Show up to church every weekend. Come here every weekend and you will extend your life four to 14 years. If you want to live longer, we found the fountain of youth. Fellowship with us. Here it is. And then number eight. Yes. Two services a week? Number eight. <sighs> this is a good one. Loved ones first. This is a good one. Each of these communities has a, something baked into their culture where they would look after their parents and their grandparents. They would circle back and they would take care of their parents. They would allow them to move into their families, or into their homes, and they would take care of them. That's a good one. And then here's number nine. And this is the one I mainly want us to see. Number nine is having a right tribe. And this is the one that I really wanted to focus most of our time on today. You see, in all of their research, having the right tribe or having the right community makes the biggest difference in the life of a person. In each of these communities, the research found that the average person had a group of roughly five friends that were committed to each other in a long-term relationship. And research from the Framingham studies show us something that I believe will blow your socks off, guys. Get ready for this. Here's what it found. It found that traits such as smoking, obesity, and happiness and even loneliness are contagious. So what this means is that the people we surround ourselves with play a huge part in developing the person we are and the person that we are becoming. So I'll give you some examples. In other words, if we hang out with people who live a healthy lifestyle, people who watch what they eat, people who take care of their bodies, research suggests that you will then become a person who takes care of your body and watches what you eat. Conversely, if we hang around friends that are frivolous with their money, that do not stick to a budget, and live way beyond their means, research shows us that you will begin to live like that as well. So the point that I'm making here is that the friends we have and the community that we surround ourselves with play a huge role in the type of person we are and the type of person that we are becoming. So all of this goes to say that if we surround ourselves with a right tribe, it can lead to a longer and a happier life. But I don't want to stop here just with this. Let's move on to our second point today, which is this, letter B. Being a part of a tribe leads to a sense of purpose and meaning leads to a sense of purpose and meaning. If you're taking notes, leads to a sense of purpose and meaning. Again, in the book Confronting Injustice Without Compromising Truth, Thaddeus Williams shares a story about a man named Christian Piccolini. Christian Piccolini. When Piccolini was 16 years old, he joined a group that was called the Chicago Area Skinheads, which was a neo-Nazi hate group, hated black people. Over the years, Piccolini rose through the ranks of this hateful group, and he eventually became their leader. He was a certified white supremacist. Piccolini hated black people, and he would say things publicly and tweet things publicly that are not appropriate for us to say here today. But fortunately for Piccolini, he was able to meet the Lord, and God saved him from his life of hate, and he was able to join a group called Life After Hate, which eventually he started leading, which helps people like him move on from a lifestyle of hate and move on from their past ways. Here's what Piccolini said in an interview many years later. He said this, quote, he said, I felt abandoned, and that led me to this community of the skinheads. I think ultimately people become extremists, not necessarily because of ideology, but instead because they are searching for three fundamental human needs. Identity, community, and a sense of purpose. I think he's right. And it does not matter if it's a far-right extremist group or a far-left extremist group. In the end, here's what people are searching for. And this is true for every single person that is listening to this right now. And this is true for every single person that is going to be listening to this online. In the end, every single person is craving for a sense of identity, a sense of community, and a sense of purpose. We all want it. We all crave for it. And in the end, people want to belong to something we all want to belong to something that is bigger than ourselves. We as humans crave for interaction with other people that view the world the same way we do. 
That can take the form in the, in the form of having a sports team that we follow or a political party that we subscribe to. It could be uh, the form of subscribing to individual min, uh, misery and this idea of victimhood mentality. We could subscribe to an environmental cause and find people that are on the same wavelength as us. But in the end, every single person, every single one of you that is out here today wants to belong, wants to be a part of something bigger than yourself. And we see this very early on in the Bible. We go back to Genesis every single week in this series, but it's for good reason. In the very beginning, what do we see? We see God creating a lot of things and calling it good. He says, look at the sky, it's good. Look at the dirt, it's good. He says, look at the birds, they're good. Look at the blue jays. Blue jays aren't good, actually, in my opinion. <laughs> I was thinking about blue jays, and I was thinking they are like, they're, maybe this is inappropriate, they're like the drug addicts of the bird world, you know what I mean? They're just kind of, yeah. <laughs> Moving on. I hate blue jays. But in this rhythm of creation, God gets to Adam, and what does he see? He sees Adam standing there by himself, and he says, that's not good. He says, it's not good for man to be alone. You see, God created us as humans to live in such a way to be a part of a kind of tribe, for a kind of community that we can be a part of. And for Christian Piccolini, his desire to belong was a God-given desire. The desire that every single one of you have to be a part of a group or a community or a tribe is something that God has placed inside of every single one of you. We all have a desire to belong to something, but unfortunately, as we all know, sometimes what God creates as good, in fact, not sometimes, most times, what God creates as good gets distorted by sin, and it can at times become very evil. But for now, I want us to see the two quick points today, which is this, that a tribe leads to a longer and healthier life when we're part of a good tribe, and then letter B, it leads to a sense of purpose and meaning for better or worse. So now that we've identified that a tribe can uh, be a part of all of our lives, is a part of all of our lives when it comes to just who we are and the essence of humanity. I now want us to look at why there are so many differences in tribes. Why there are so many differences in tribes. And so this leads us to our second question. Why do we see such a vast difference between tribes? In other words, why is it that over the last 30 or so years, 50 or so years, we are seeing such a precipitous rise in extremist ideology from the right side of the aisle and from the left side of the aisle? Why is it that in 2020 we have seen crazy things take place in our country? Federal buildings being burned down or ransacked? Why is it that talks of racism and sexism and feminism are becoming such polarizing topics in today's vernacular? Well, I think in order for us to understand how we got to this very polarizing day and age, it's important for us to rewind and look at the founding philosophy of how we got here. And in order to do that, I want all of us to rewind, and I want us to look at a very particular philosopher by the name of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Can we say Rousseau together, a little French? It might be kind of fun for us. Ready? Rousseau. One more time, a little bit more pizzazz, like you got a baguette in your hand. Rousseau. Very good. Now, some of us may not be familiar with who this man is, but we have been influenced by his thoughts and by his beliefs. What Rousseau is most known for is his belief on human nature. And so here is what Rousseau believes. Listen to this. Rousseau believes that every person is born good. He believes that every person at its core is born moral, born virtuous, and born benevolent. Here's what he writes. He writes this, quote, The fundamental principle of all morality upon which I have reasoned in all my writings and which I developed with all the clarity of which I am capable is that man is a being who is naturally good, loving justice and order that there is no original perversity in the human heart, and the fir first movements of nature are always good. So are you seeing what Rousseau believes? Rousseau believes that humans, that you, naturally are born good. But then the next logical question I think that we should ask is, well, what happened? Because all we have to do is look around and look at the different people of the world, and we see that there's a lot of not good people. And so how did good people at their birth become distorted and become bad? Well, here's what Rousseau would say to that. Here's how he would answer. He would say this. He says, man is naturally good, and it is solely by institutions that man becomes wicked. That's what Rousseau believes. Now, this is a very telling statement. Here's what it means. It means that man is good, and the only way that man is distorted and flawed is through institutions. What institutions, you ask, Rousseau follows up. 
He talks about traditional institutions, such as the family and such as the church. And Rousseauian philosophy is what we are experiencing right now in this day and age. We are seeing traditional institutions being pulled down and crushed. Police, government, church, family. This is Rousseau's philosophy in play because in order for people to truly excel, we have to get rid of any kind of institution because institutions oppress people. That's what Rousseau believes. So in other words, when we read stories about Abraham Lincoln, statues of him being torn down, that is Rousseau's philosophy being played out. In order to redeem our country, we have got to rip out the foundation of it. When we read books like Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States, we must see that that is a revisionist history trying to discredit and devalue the foundation of a society that we still live in. That's Rousseau at work. So Rousseau believes that mankind at its core is good, and the only thing that makes man bad is institutions, such as the church and the family, and so on and so forth. That is what Rousseau teaches. He starts with the premise that people are good, but they're corrupted by institutions. Now, what does this result in? Because this is what matters most. Here's what Rousseau in philosophy believes in, and this is so important for us to see. What this kind of belief turns into is this idea of oppression versus oppressor. It creates a group of people which become identified by the oppression that they endure. Now let's compare Rousseau's philosophy to what the Bible teaches. Here's what Romans 3.23 says. It says this, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Do you see that? It says, for all have sinned, every single one of us, every single one of you have sinned and has fallen short of God's glory. Glory. So according to the Bible, here's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that every single one of you, even sweet Sailor Rose, who's just a little baby, rich, poor, male, female, black, white, religious, secular, every single one of us is on a level playing field. We all have the same fundamental group identity, and that group identity is this, sinner, depravity, and the need of something that can save us. According to Genesis 3, we're all born under the curse of sin. In other words, none of you have to be taught how to be selfish. None of us have to be taught how to tell a lie. Like that's not something my sister's gonna be teaching her baby. All right, Selah, here's how you become a jerk. (laughs) She's not gonna have to teach her that. I don't think Selah has that in her, by the way. She's a little angel. But we don't need to be taught how to do these kind of things. We don't teach our little children how to be selfish. They just are. You see, at the base level, every single person is on a level playing field as a sinner. So here's what this means. Every single person alive right now, left wing or right wing, socialist or capitalist, at the core of every single person, we are a part of the same tribe. You say, Austin, I don't have much in common with the person who is freaking out right now over the Roe v. Wade decision. Yes, you do. At the core of who you are is a sinner just like that person, and you have that in common with them. You have that in common with them. That tribe that we're a part of is a tribe that is at its very foundation marked by our depravity and our need for a savior. Again, it can be difficult for some of us to see what we may have in common with people that that view the world differently than we do. Austin, I don't have anything in common with with someone who who, who believes in in, in pro-choice or or pro-life ideology. Austin, I have nothing in common with someone who thinks that it's okay for drag queens to go into public libraries and poison the minds of our children. But here's what we can't forget. We can't forget that the Bible teaches something radical, and that is at the foundation of every single person here is this understanding that we are all sinners in need of a Savior to resurrect this broken soul of ours, to save us. And so when we think about ways to push back against groups of people we disagree with, it is foundational that we remember that every single one of us as humans have something in common, and that is a need for a savior. And that is the soul's longing to be redeemed by a good God. And oftentimes we see very unhealthy Christian tribes created because we forget this fundamental truth. And so here's what this practically looks like for us as Christians. It means that we as Christians should not be, listen to this, walking around with this sense of superiority or this idea of a savior complex in our minds. 
like we are this completed, finished work, bastion of light in the world. No, it's been said that the Christian life is simple. It's simply one beggar telling another beggar where to get bread. That's what we do. Oh, you're looking for identity. You're looking for a sense of meaning in your life. Hey, I found identity. I found purpose. I found value. It was in the resurrected Savior of the world, Jesus. Let me tell you about him. Oh, oh, your, your, your soul is longing to try to find your worth in, 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 in a boy or in a girl or in your sexuality or in your view on gender. Well, let, let me tell you what God has to say about you. Let me tell you what the Bible has to say about your identity. Let me tell you that the scripture says that you have been fearfully and wonderfully made and that he knit you together in your mother's womb. Let me tell you about the reality that God knows you and loves you and cherishes you. Let me tell you about that. That, ought, that has got to be our disposition. So this takes us to our third and final question of the day, which is this, number three, what makes the Christian community so unique? I could spend 45 minutes just on this one, but I don't want to do that because we're all baking right now. Before our time, I do want to discuss two very important things that do warrant some discussion from us. The first thing I want us to talk about is this, letter A. We as Christians believe in unity and togetherness, not oppression and divisiveness. I want you to write that down. We as Christians believe in unity and togetherness, not oppression and divisiveness. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time on this topic because in today's culture and climate, there is a lot of talk about victims, a lot of talk about oppression, and a lot of talk about tyranny. In fact, many of the tribes, many of the groups that you and I are very well acquainted with in this day and age are groups created to push back against oppression and tyranny. And it creates victims. Well, as Christians, the fight against oppression, listen to me, is not something that dominates our psyche. As Christians, we do not identify ourselves as victims. It's very important we hear this. I want to give you some examples from the Bible that show us that this victimhood mentality is not a defining characteristic about who we are. Here's what Acts chapter 2 says. In Acts chapter 2, we see quite a few things happening. We see the foundation of the early church, and we also see the arrival of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's what it says in Acts chapter 2. It says this, Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. So, I want to paint the picture here. I want you to envision that in that room right there, there are people from every nation under heaven. There are Egyptians. There are Europeans. There are Asians. Australians, Americans, Canadians, South Americans, people from every part of the world gathered together in our one building. This is what's happening here. And then picture three Jewish dudes or a few Jewish guys standing up in front of all of them. That's what's taking place. And here's what it says. It says, at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished saying, are not all of those who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judah, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both the Jews and proselytes, Cretans, Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongue the mighty works of God. And so here in Acts chapter 2, this is a melting pot. We have people from Asia, people from Europe, people from the Middle East, people from Africa, all gathering together in one room. And we see many different types of people that are represented by many different types of tribes. Each one of these people would have a different political ideological belief. Each of these people would have came from a different governmental system. Now here's what the early church leaders did not do. The early church leaders did not stand in front of this multitude of people and they did not play a game of who had been oppressed the most. They did not play the Olympics of oppression and raise their hand and say, who's been oppressed here the most? And they could have. And I want to tell you why they could have. Because the Jewish leaders here had a lot to potentially complain about. I, I want to just run the docket here. Who is gathered in this room? We see some Egyptians. I could envision Peter standing up in front of these Egyptians and saying, don't you remember what your forefathers did to our ancestors? 
Don't you remember when your Pharaoh systematically went through and killed the firstborn boys? Don't you remember what happened when the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt? Don't you remember the kind of beating that we endured under your forefathers? They could have looked at the Romans and said, right now, your people are systematically going through and crucifying Jewish people and Christians upside down. They could have looked to the Romans and said, your people desecrated our temples. Your people ruined our sacred spaces. The first century Jewish people had many grounds to be someone who could identify with their oppression or the difficulty that they experienced in their life. But we don't see that in the Bible. What we see in the Bible is that people like Paul, John, Peter wanted nothing to do with this poison of victimhood mentality. Instead, what we're taught in the Bible is something much more important and much more life-changing, and that is this. We cling to the gospel instead of clinging to an identity that is rooted in oppression or victimization. Now, don't get me wrong. As Christians, you will endure persecution. You will endure oppression, at least if you're living for Christ the right way. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3. He says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life will be persecuted. Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So according to the Bible, if you live, if you choose to live according to the word of God, buckle up because oppression, persecution are going to be coming your way. But here's the thing. The persecution and the oppression that we may experience is not the defining principle of who we are. It's not the defining principle of who we are. As Christians, we are much more than what we endure. We are much more than what we experience. Our identity is not found in what we've overcome or what we're trying to accomplish politically. Our identity as Christians is this. Our identity is rooted in the finished work of Jesus and our lives are modeled after a selfless, loving, caring, just, merciful, and gracious God who loved us dearly. That's what our identity is rooted in. That's what our worth is found in. And this is very countercultural because in today's culture, it seems like the most popular movements of the day are marked by past oppression or past victimization. This is not what the Bible teaches. Romans 8, 30, Romans 8 verse 37 says this for you and me as Christians. It says, in all of these things, in all oppression, in all difficulty, in all trials, we are more than conquerors because of him who loved us. We're more than conquerors. So Christians don't play the victim card because we recognize that this world is not our home and we recognize that we have something much greater to look forward to with an eternity with Jesus forever. So that's the first point I want us to see very clearly. And that is this, letter A. We as Christians believe in unity and togetherness, not oppression and divisiveness. We are not marked by any sense of envisioned oppression or persecution we have. Our identity is rooted in the finished work of Jesus. You will endure persecution. You will endure hard times. Those hard times don't identify you as a person. Some of us right now, no doubt, are going through very difficult circumstances in our life. Maybe we're dealing with family troubles. Maybe we're dealing with issues in our family that is causing separation. Friend, I want to tell you, you are not identified by what your family says about you or by what your friends say about you or what comments on Facebook say about you or what your grandparents say about you or what your coworkers say about you. Your identity is firmly rooted in the unchangeable truth of the gospel and that is that Jesus loves you and cares for you and knows you intimately and personally. That's where your identity is rooted in and that's unchanging. It's unswerving. It's not going anywhere. It's stable. It's rooted. It's rooted. We don't play the victim card because we're more than conquerors. We're more than conquerors. Here's the last one, letter B. We recognize the importance of grace for all people. We talked about this earlier, but at the foundation of every single one of our stories is the need for Jesus to save our hearts and to save our souls from eternal damnation. That's what we need. Every single one of us needs that kindness from Jesus every single moment of every single day. And that same grace that we sing about, that same grace that Rachel leads us in on Sunday mornings is the same grace that every single person in the world needs. Earlier, I shared with you that story about Christian Piccolini, right? The the Chicago area skinhead, the neo-Nazi who hated black people. Later on in his story, he talks about how the one permanent thing that can change 
the most racist, hateful, bigoted, sexist people in the world is not a different ideology and it's not a different political system. That's what so many of us, this is one of the biggest lies that Christians believe. It's in order to save people that disagree with us, we have to get them on our side of the aisle. We have to get them to view this particular issue the way we do. No, no, no. We start with the souls. We start with something that will transform their lives, and that is the story of Jesus. We start with that. Piccolini agrees with this. He says the only thing that will work is the life-saving story of Jesus and how his grace extends to every single person. He says, if we want to see bad tribes shut down, if we want to see wicked things kicked out of schools, if we want to see bad thoughts be removed, if we want to see race relations get smoothed out in our country, it begins and it ends with one thing, the gospel of Jesus. It's the only thing that will make a lasting change in our world. And so friends, here's how I want to end our time. It's with a call to action. The call to action is this. This is very important. Don't get distracted. Don't get distracted. We can't get distracted by peripheral arguments that serve as distractions from what matters most. Here's what I want to say. Every time we feel the urge to get into a debate with somebody about pro-choice or pro-life, be curious to find a way how you can somehow get the story and redemption of Jesus into that conversation. Every single time there is that urge to fight back, launch arrows, chuck grenades at people that we disagree with ideologically or over political things, be intentional about finding ways to share with people the gospel. As important as policies are, as important as politics are, if we want to see the world changed, it starts with the souls of individuals. It starts with the person of Jesus saving them. And so don't get distracted, friends. Don't get distracted. Starts, start with the main thing. Paul tells the church in Corinth this. He says in 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 15, he says, of everything that I've written to you, of everything that I have shared with you, and if you've ever read the New Testament, odds are you've read a lot of Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament. He says, the most important thing is this, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised to life. You say, what's the main thing I should take away from this lesson? It's that. Lead with what is most important. Lead with the gospel. Lead with the redemption that's found in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Never forget this simple truth and never grow tired and never grow weary of sharing the good news of Jesus because that message will never go out of style and it will never lose its power. So don't get distracted. Let's stay focused. Let's be dedicated. Let's be vigilant. Let's pray.